Good morning, Interweb, World Builders Log 24. Today, we're going to talk topography. We are going to take a map that looks like this and turn it into something that looks like this. But first, as always, we got to do some follow up from the previous video. First up, the website has been updated. The continents now have placeholder names Picard, Esri, Degra, and Janar. No prizes for guessing where those names are coming from. Next, some people noticed that on Esri here, no fjords were marked in in the north in the previous video. That is by design. Fjords are an absolute nightmare. They will be done, but I'm just pushing them off for now. Next, quick clarification of what's going on in Picard. In the deep southern regions here, those that will likely be affected by ice caps, the coastlines don't necessarily represent where the land meets the sea, rather where the fast ice meets the sea. And fast ice is ice that's secured to something, be it land or a continental shelf. What's going on underneath this ice, I'm not depicting. Or in other words, if you look at Antarctica without the ice, we're not depicting something like this. We're depicting something more like this. Ice slash land, continental shelf. Ice or land, continental shelf. Okay, and the final point, thanks for bearing with me. I promise we'll get to topography in a second is that I found the, just the world's weirdest bug in the spreadsheet and I cannot for the life of me figure out how in the hell to fix it. In the apparent size and brightness tab, in the moon apparent size and brightness section, this cell, the semi-major axis cell, has a bug associated with it. That is, in my copy, if I go to data, data validation, you'll see here that the only data validation in this sheet is this column here, atmosphere, right? Note that no data validation is applying to this cell. That's what's in my master copy. But for, again, reasons I cannot understand, any copy that's made from my master copy apparently just creates data validation there that prevents the user from using this cell correctly. And I, I literally, I cannot fix this because it's just not present in my master copy. So everyone's gonna have to fix this manually or some spreadsheet savant has to email me and let me know what's going on. And you do this, just to be clear, you go to here, you go to data, data validation. You find uh, in the list here, you find what validation applies to this cell, C60, highlight it and then just remove it. Really sorry about this. Again, it's just, it's inexplicable. I do not know what's going on. All right, it is time. Let's do some topography. Okay, first things first, we're going to export a map from Gplates and stick it into a vector-based drawing program like Illustrator or Inkscape. I'd recommend turning on your land layer, your continental shelf layer, all your orogenies, large Indian provinces, hotspots, plate boundaries, and also your ocean crust layer. With all that done, just like in previous videos, you go to reconstruction, export, single snapshot instance, use main window time, click that, choose a directory, go to add export, and we are going to go to projected geometries. We're going to choose SVG, a vector format, constraint aspect ratio, and then make this, you can make this as big or small as you want. It's vector, it can scale. There's some raster stuff in here, so bigger is better. Let's just say 2,500, but you could easily double or triple that, depending on what your computer can handle. So I'm going to go with that, hit okay, and then I'm going to export. Hello there folks, Editor Edgar here. Past Edgar, that guy was an idiot. He totally forgot to mention the most important thing. You have to export in rectangular projection. That's non-negotiable and an absolute must because we're going to bounce back and forth between Illustrator and Gplates to help control for projection distortion. And the only projection that would allow us to do that is rectangular projection. I apologize profusely for the wrongs of past Edgar. Rest assured, he will be sanctioned appropriately. So then we're going to open up that file in Illustrator. I'm going to undock my layers panel here for a second. If you don't see this panel, go to Windows, Layers. And you'll see that this image is comprised of just a bunch of layers. We're going to need to tidy things up here a little bit. Group like things, get rid of invisible layers, and you should be left with something like this. One sea layer, one ocean crust age layer, one base map, without topographical information, and then one layer for everything else. I'm gonna go Control A to select everything, and I'm gonna hit Command or Control Shift and G to ungroup everything. So now we have three individual groups. I'm gonna go down to this plus icon here, make a new layer. I'm gonna call this layer just like Guides, and I'm gonna move this topographic layer into Guides. I'm gonna select this icon here, click to target it, and I'm gonna go up to the top here where it says opacity and I'll drop the opacity down to something like say 50%. 
I'm going to go to the plus icon here, create another new layer. I'm going to call this topo. This is the layer upon which we're going to draw. And I'm going to put that in between my guides and my layer one here. I might just rename this as base for now. Eventually, when we come to do the C, we'll move these around and create new guide layers. But for now, this is all we need. And then I'm also going to hit a new layer again. And I'm going to call this layer uh, color ramp, which we'll get to in a second. So four layers, color ramp, guides, your drawing layer, and the stuff you import it. I'm going to move my layers panel back down here. Scoot this over. Very good. Now, next thing, we have all of this white space here, which is no good. So in Illustrator, you can go shift O to bring up the artboard tool. Essentially what is in the artboard will be exported. So I'm going to crop the artboard down to the actual map. So I'm just going to crop this down. Hopefully this will snap into place. Marvelous. Perfect. And we can just go back up to our selection tool here to click off that. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create our color ramp for our topography. So I am going, I'm going to lock all the other layers by clicking in this empty space on the left here. And I am going to highlight the color ramp layer. And that's what we're going to use. So M on the keyboard, this will draw a shape, just draw any old rectangular looking thing, something like that. If you go down to the corner here, you'll see uh, two boxes. The one that's filled in, that's your fill. Uh, the one that's just a contour, that's your stroke. So I'm gonna click on the fill color and I am going to enter in some sort of green color for land, we'll say, just as a demonstration. Something like this, we'll say. Then I'm going to click and drag this and while dragging hold option, this will create a copy and I'm also gonna hold shift so it stays parallel. And I'm just gonna drag this out somewhere to here. I'm gonna highlight that, double click here and choose some sort of color for like mid-level mountains, we'll say. Usually this is kind of like a yellowy sort of color. Let's say something like that. Okay, gonna click that, drag it, hold option and shift while doing so, just drag it somewhere up here. Same thing again, drag option and shift. I'll drag this out to here. Keep this the same. This I'm gonna change to some sort of like high mountain color. Again, usually some sort of brown. Let's say something like that. Drag, Alt and Shift. And then I'm gonna choose some sort of snow cap color. Something like that. Low lying elevations, medium high elevations, high elevations, extreme elevations. Now what we'd like to do is get a ramp of colors in between each of these. And Illustrator has just a baller tool to do this. This is the blend tool. You can find it here or you can hit W on the keyboard. If you double click the icon, you'll bring up a menu here, blend options. What we're looking for here is specified steps. And the question we're asking is, how many colors do we want in between, say, these two colors? Let's say I want three, for argument's sake. Keep this the same, hit OK. And then with your blend tool highlighted, click one end of the spectrum and then the other end of the spectrum. And Illustrator will make a gradient between the two colors you've highlighted. And the cool thing about this is that you can like select this one, for example, bring up its color. And if you change it to something mad like this, it'll automatically update, All right? So let's do the same thing up here with our blend tool selected, double click. Um, for this guy, I'm gonna say we want two colors in between our two outer colors here. The idea being that at lower elevations, you want more distinctions, at upper elevations, you want less distinctions. So we go two and we go, okay, we click one end of the spectrum and another end and we get that. Brill. And then up here, double click the blend tool. Let's say we only want one in between. We go okay, click, click, done. And from here we can make things look pretty. So for example, we can hit A on the keyboard, select uh, say this end of the spectrum. You gotta hit A, it has to be the direct selection tool. Select that and then just shift and left arrow to close down the spaces, something like that. Do the same thing up here. V on the keyboard, and then we'll drag a selection around all of these. Up here in the align tools, you can go center align, and then again, click and drag to line them up perfectly. One color ramp. And to be clear, the reason why we did this in three stages is because we divided up the spectrum into low, medium, high, extremely high, and chose different intervals within each range. All right, let's select that. Command G, let's group it up. Perfect. And if you notice in my map here, this is the color spectrum 
I came up with, or rather I stole from Wikipedia, got rid of a few things and changed the base one to a more teal color. Note as well, the exact same technique applies in getting ocean colors. So we have some elevation heights here, so we need to figure out how to get them. The natural question to ask, I think, would be, how tall is stuff in my world? Like we know that this one here is from zero to something. It begins at sea level. But where does this end? Where does the spectrum end? So to do this, we'll pop into the Worldsmith. There's a new version out, version 4.01. It's a major update because if you go down to the bottom tab thing here, go over to tectonics, we have a new sheet here for figuring out um, tectonic related things. Again, instead of explaining this, I'm just going to go through it and hopefully it'll all make sense when you see it in practice. First thing we need to do is enter in a gravity value here on my planet that is 1.340 G. The spreadsheet then will take that information and compute a max peak height for my world. That is to say that my world's Everest cannot be greater than this value here. This is a very broad approximation, so just take it as a ballpark figure. For what it's worth on Earth, a planet with 1 G, the max peak height is 9.2k, and given that Everest I think is 8.8 .8 something, that's a pretty good approximation. So even if some tectonic features get close to this range, they'll be few and far between. So what I normally do, all things being equal, is about a kilometer or two below this value, make that your upper color ramp distinction. So this is about seven, so we'll say about maybe five. All right, and we know that this chap here starts at zero meters. And from here, what I usually do is I usually do every 100 meters up until 200. Then I go to 500. Then I go to 1,000. 1, 5, 2,000, and from there, every kilometer. So the idea is just like with the colors, at lower elevations, we have more distinctions and the elevation ranges become wider and wider as we proceed upwards. Just because most of your topography is gonna to be at the bottom end of the spectrum. So we want more detail there. All right, select everything, command or control G. One color ramp, done. So now we have our elevations. We'd want to know where we're gonna place those elevations. So to demonstrate this, I'm gonna work on the middle continent here, Degra. Let's pop it into orthographic view. Let's zoom in on this fella here. And we do a little bit of analysis. We have along here an Andean range, which note will extend down through the island arc. We have here an old orogeny that is likely ground flat. We have a large igneous province, and we also have a thicker subduction zone orogeny here, probably laramide. And also we have deep black shades here, which means that the orogeny is active. And we have some more grayer shades, which means that the erogeny is inactive. So it's eroding down. And again, this erogeny will extend all the way down the island arc here. And up here, sorry, we'll also have erogeny like Sumatra going on Andean style. So that's a little general overview. How about we start then figuring out the elevations of this Andean range, just because I think it's going to be the easiest. So F on the keyboard, select the Andean range. And we see that it began at 1,300. So let's go back to 1,300. And let's just have a quick glance through its history. Okay, so that is pretty simple stuff. It's basically just a Andean range shows history, nothing complicated, brilliant. So over to the spreadsheet and we ask ourselves, is the mountain range we're looking at active? Or is it inactive? Well, it's black, therefore active, but also we know it's active because it's next to a subduction zone. So we'll pop up to our active mountain range thing here. We select the type of mountain range we're dealing with. We are dealing with an Andean mountain range. As you select different types, the spreadsheet will update and give you a different cross section of the mountain range you're dealing with. Shout out World Building Pasta. I took with permission some of the pictures from his blog, adapted them a little bit for the spreadsheet. So it's his original work. And FYI, a lot of the data we're going to hear is also pulled from World Building Pasta, but adapted for the Worldsmith. So again, shout out World Building Pasta, just the best world building blog on the internet. Please go check him out. Links in the description. All right, we have an Andean mountain range. Excellent. Next we need to set is a scaling factor. So basically what, what's going to happen is that the topographical features on your world are going to scale with gravity. Specifically, they are going to scale by one over G to the power of X. 
where x here is this value that you put in here. The range here is between one and two. Please don't go outside that range. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And also be somewhat close to two because there's a thing called Cowles rule, which states that in the solar system, topographic features scale by one over G squared, i.e. the scaling factor is two. But I've allowed some customizability. So 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, that sort of thing. I'm going to go with 1.7. All right, and because we're dealing with Andean range, we see that we have these features going on. An outer arc ridge, so basically a little pre-mountain chain, a four arc basin, a slope up to a plateau, then a slope into a back arc. All pretty self-explanatory. Oh, and let me clear these. So for each of these features here, the spreadsheet gives a suggested height range and a suggested width range. Just be careful, the heights are in meters, the widths are in kilometers. If the height is ever suggested as being zero, or at least zero is a possibility, that means the feature can be at sea level or below sea level. It's up to you. So in the example of a four arc basin, it's at zero, you could totally have a four arc basin that dips down below sea level. If zero is ever suggested in the width range, that implies that the feature may not be present at all. So for example, an outer arc ridge, that is not always present. And if you don't want it to be present, simply select zero. So it's just simply a case of looking at the ranges and choosing something you like. Then for the four slope, you'll see the suggested range is tapering. And all that means it goes from whatever height value selected for your four arc basin up until your height value of the plateau. So don't input anything here, just leave it blank. And for the width here, you say the suggested range is infinity. And that's because this doesn't, this back arc region basically doesn't stop. It just keeps tapering off until the next feature is met, be it a coastline or another mountain range, etc. And just like with tapering here, we are going to leave this blank because of this infinity sign. Okay, and then we will repeat for each of the features. So let's do this one over here. So again, the workflow is check its history run the numbers, input numbers into Illustrator. So we'll check this fella's history. So let's go to the oldest piece of the puzzle here, which would be this gray one. The closer it is to white, the older it is. Form that 1280. So let's go back to there. Oh, actually there must be something older going on here. So this range form starts to form here. So that's 1300. We have here Andean, and this is pretty thick here. So let's call that Laramide, probably as a result of this plate boundary getting subducted under this continent. So we have Laramide here, still Andean, Laramide continues. Yeah, so as this goes along, it'll create Laramide. So we'll get a Laramide here, and then we'll finish into our modern world with another Laramide. So we'll have like three Laramide stages. Here. Okay, so this this can get a little bit complicated. Three Laramide stages. The oldest Laramides are here, middle age Laramides, new Laramides. But along their edge, they will maintain an Andean-like boundary because that's active. So the hinterlands are kind of inactive. The subduction zone that created them has long since traveled away, but the margin is still active. So because we have inactive ranges, we need to deal with this section of the calculator here. So we start active mountain ranges. We'll start by putting in Laramide, the picture updates. Laramides are basically Andean orogeny, but with a big plateau. Scaling factor obviously has to remain the same. One scaling factor for everything on your world. We repeat by putting in heights and widths, and this is that we're putting in the initial heights and widths of our features. So for example, in our first stage of orogeny here, what's happening here, we're importing the data for this point in time, when they were young, when they were active. All very self-explanatory, so I'll time-lapse through this. Oh, and I just measured in G plates roughly how thick this is to get a guide. So it's about 388. So I'm gonna say maybe the width of this plateau is about 300, including a bit of tapering, etc. cetera. 
Okay, only thing to point out here that in the Laramide section, you're asked or the suggested height range is taper to peak of X. So the height you input here is this peak here. So you have a four arc base in height. I selected zero. This will taper gradually up to a distinct peak here. Input that peak here. Then we have the plateau, that's this height. And then we have this like second line of peaks going on here. Taper from peak of X, select the value from X and that'll taper away until we get to the back arc, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, so those are the initial conditions. How things were 150 million years ago. Because 1,300, my world, my modern world is at 1,150. So it's 150 million years ago. So we pop down to our inactive mountain range section. We are asked to select an erosion rate and an age. So that's the age of your mountain chain. I notice this is 150 and we need to input an erosion rate. The rate you put in here should be between four and five meters per million years. I'll say 4.6 for argument's sake. Now I'm putting those numbers from a paper understanding Earth's eroding surface with 10 beryllium in which there is this cool chart. If I can find it back, here we are that gives you the erosion rates of various outcroppings. Read mountains here. The median values I think are the most illustrative here and the ones that I've been using on a global scale about five meters per million years in terms of mountains eroding. But notice that there's also a bunch of subdivisions given here. Interestingly, we have here like division by climate zone, arid, cold, polar, temperate, tropical. It's not made explicit, but I feel like these are the five coping climate zones, except what should be continental is labeled cold. I'm not 100% sure, but either way, it gives erosion rates for each of these, 3, 7, 1, 16, and 5, respectively. The problem with this, in particular, say the polar region, is that the paper pulls data from Antarctica. We have a very small set. Like the polar regions, there isn't actually a whole lot of land going on in the polar regions. So necessarily, there's a really small set of data. And I think this produces somewhat odd result that temperate zone, like erosion, is 16 times more effective than in the polar zone, which in and of itself makes sense. It's just the, the difference is massive here or the difference between say polar and the cold regions. Mountains in cold regions erode seven times faster than polar regions. That, that seems a little bit weird to me, but either way, if you're feeling courageous and or you understand these numbers a little bit better, you can use these numbers. They're listed in the spreadsheet. If you so desire, you can get even more granule, but I, I would shy against it for the aforementioned reasons. And also because like, continents change zones over time like this chap is in like the temperate zone here but he's going to end up in the tropics so you have to kind of account for that and i honestly i think like that's way too much detail even for me so i would say just go with a, a global analysis of four or five ish like i said i'll go with 4.6 and the spreadsheet uses these values to give you the heights and widths of your inactive mountain range at the current time period so for example 150 million years ago the plateau on my Laramide here, I set it to be 3,000 meters. It is now 2,310 meters. The only wrinkle here is that recall, we said that at all points here throughout this, this continent's history, there's always been an active margin. So whilst the hinterlands here have been eroding away, the margin here is always Andean. It's always being uplifted. So I would look at this and I would say, when it says here tapers to a peak, of 3,500, I, I would say that that peak is maintained. The hinterlands, the plateau and the back slope, etc., they'll roll away, if that makes sense. I won't do this here just to save time, but again, you'd make notes of this, take some screenshots, import them into Illustrator just like we did and place it next to your Laramide range. Okay, now for the Large Igneous Province. Again, history, calculation, Illustrator. So the Large Igneous Province popped off at 1380 and became inactive at 1370. So 1370 minus 1150 on my world, that's 220 million years. That's about one Siberian traps and nothing weird is happening to this, I don't think. Nope, it's just continuing on into the modern world. Now, the spreadsheet does not account for large igneous provinces, largely because the data is a little bit spotty. Here's what I do. Geologists feel free to vehemently disagree with me and let me know better methodology in comments if such a thing exists. So I go to Andean and I'm going to clear all of this data. And essentially I'm just going to model a large igneous province as being just the plateau portion of an Andean orogeny. So I'll go to plateau here, 610 to 3650. Let's just say 3000 meters for the sake of it. I'm not going to worry about any of these widths because the width is going to be given by this area. Oh, and actually, should I do 3000? Hold on, wait a minute. 
wait a minute. Oh yeah, he, he is a large Ignis province. So the bigger the large Ignis province, the higher I'll say it initially was. In fact, I think that's one of the largest on this world. So let's bump. 3-5 for argument's sake. Okay, it is 220 million years old. The erosion rate, I mean, you can vary it if you want. I usually just end up holding it stable for the entire globe. Again, because I'm working on a global average. So it was at 3500. It is currently then at, we'll call it 25. So all I would do then is just come in here and just write 25 for this. Again, the exact shape and morphology is up to our artistic intent. Next, the old mountain range here. Actually, hold on. Just a quick note on this chap here. Notice that when we looked at the Andean orogeny, which will be going on here, we talked about an outer arc ridge. So you have like a little ridge, then a basin, and then our main ridge. That's essentially what this is. This is an outer arc ridge. So when we were running, when we we're running the numbers, we'd make sure to compute that. And in fact, again, you can just use G plates. So S on the keyboard, I'll choose this Y boy here. That's about 40 kilometers. So I'll make that my outer arc ridge, etc. Otherwise it's the same process as this Andean range here. Anyhow, the old mountain range. History, calculation, illustrator. So you became inactive at 1680. That's 530 million years ago. Almost certainly ground down flat. But let's check it out. So that mountain range began life here. So we have this like small peninsula looking thing. There's going to be an island arc ridge happening here that will collide with that to form this, this shape here. So island arc versus continent, we'll call it. Wouldn't call that Himalayan. I'd call that Ural. So we go back into spreadsheet. Ural orogeny, picture updates, new categories are given here. Okay, just like before, we would fill in the initial conditions for when it was active. That is 530 million years ago. Something like that. Erosion rate, 4.6. Again, the advocacy here is choose a global average and just stick with it. Age, 530. And we'll see that we have zeros all across the board in terms of height. The mountain range is so old, it's been ground down to nothing. Now, here's the thing, right? That is either really interesting or really boring, depending on your persuasion. Like there's gonna be really cool orogeny going on along here. Like the topography is gonna to be really detailed and we're gonna have a thin strip of topography here and that's it. You might look at that and go, that's cool contrast. I like, I like that sort of aesthetic. Or we could find a way of having that mountain not be completely gone and having more complex orogeny here as well. And the way we accomplish this by saying that just some uplift occurs or broader isostatic rebound occurs. The idea here is that like a mountain is built up, in this case, a Ural mountain. Mountains, lots of mass, very heavy. That causes the crust to kind of sink. But as the mountain becomes inactive, when it's not being continuously maintained, it'll erode away. The mass will decrease, the weight will decrease. So the crust will kind of like spring back up. The net effect of it, grossly oversimplifying everything here, is that the kind of tougher roots of the mountain range can poke back out above the surrounding landscape. So if we wanted to do that here, I would just make a note of that. We'll say that this mountain range should be zero, but we'll do some, we'll do some uplift. And again, just like with the large Igneous province, the exact morphology is gonna be really messy. So it's up to our uh, artistic interpretation, which bits get uplifted. Like maybe up here where it's at its widest, it might've been at its heaviest. So the rebound could have been the most. So we might have some very small peaks sticking up through here. And when I say small, I mean very small. This isn't like thousands of meters sort of jazz, like a few hundred maybe tops. Okay, and that is basically how to go around planning. Now, do you need to do any of this? Absolutely not. You can totally just draw topography based on gut feeling. And if I'm gonna be frank with you, that's kind of what I did when I produced the map that I showed at the start of the video. I was working with a beta version of the calculator that wasn't as detailed. So a lot of what I was doing was just based on gut feel. Okay, so with all the data there garnered, it's time to put in the actual topography. The way you do this is you hit I on the keyboard, you go up to your color ramp, you select a color, I usually start with either the second color up or the highest one given the data I've just got. The idea being that like we already have a base color, that's the map. So I'll choose the second layer up here. That is our 100 to 200 height color. And then I'm gonna zoom in on the map, ensure that my color ramp, my guides and my base layer are locked so I don't draw on them. And I make sure that your topo layer is highlighted. 
Then hit N on the keyboard, pop over to the side here, double click the pencil menu, set the fidelity to accurate, fill in new pencil strokes, hit OK. And then it is simply a case of just drawing shapes. Hello everyone, future Edgar here, past Edgar, he's up to his old shenanigans again. He neglected to inform you that you don't want to be doing this sort of work with a mouse. The stylus on a tablet, great, drawing tablet, wonderful, mouse, no good. It is theoretically possible, but you're just gonna give yourself whopping RSI and it's gonna be zero crack. Trust me, I used to use a mouse, please don't be like me. So, I'll just come along here. I know that this large Ignis province is going to be one big plateau. I'm just going to come along here, trace along the coast a little bit. Something like that. You don't need to be too accurate. In fact, I'm not being very accurate here because it's just demonstration purposes. You'll see a time lapse of what I actually did in a few minutes. Something like this. Maybe put in some shapes like that. Boom. And if you take off the guides, you can see what the layer actually looks like. Layer one, done. Now let's imagine we want a kind of sheer cliff sort of thing going on along this coastline. For no other reason than I just want to demonstrate a point here. This can be remarkably hard to do. I'll hit command zero on the keyboard to zoom out. I on the keyboard for an eyedropper tool. I'm going to pop up to my next layer up here, click it, then back to N and then we'll zoom back in. Now, if I want to create a kind of like rapidly ascending bit of topography here I have to zoom right in and I have to like really carefully draw along here and be very careful not to go outside the lines it could be a bit of a nightmare so what you can do to speed this process up a little bit is you can hit V on the keyboard select the bottom layer command C to copy it and then command F to paste it in place it's got to be command F if you do command V it just pastes it to the center of your viewport all right so now we have two copies of that we'll go Command O to zoom out. I will eyedropper it to the next uh, elevation up. Then we'll zoom back in. Right click on it. Go to make compound path. And then go to object path offset path. And what this does is it takes the path and just like steps it back. It shrinks it basically. So we could do something like negative 0.5. You can mess around with the miter limit here. I'd keep this as round and then go OK. All right, and now if we select this and we get rid of our initial compound path, we now have some really tight topography here. Now, that looks a little bit kind of um, artificial, like it's a perfect copy. So I'm gonna select this, I'm gonna go to Effect, Distort and Transform, Roughen, and don't do that, that is crazy. Uh, go to Absolute, select Absolute. I'll drop the size and detail right down to zero and then just increase these slowly. So if I do size like that, oh, and go to Smooth, excellent. Uh, level of detail. I'll make sure you have preview ticked as well so you can see what's going on. So yeah, I keep that fairly low. So just something like that, 0.3 pixels and go OK. And you see that kind of breaks it up a little bit. And then we'd repeat the same process again, copying, etc., etc. each time ruffling, and then you get a kind of really unpredictable um, sort of cliff face thing. Now, obviously at the back, or not obviously, uh, maybe at the back, we don't want it to have this really tight. We want it to taper a little bit. Here's another technique you can use. So N on the keyboard for your pencil. And let's say we want to, we want to just get rid of all of this here and redesign it ourselves. So we can just come in here, draw a line all the way across, let's say through here, covering the area that we want to get rid of. V on the keyboard, select what we've just drawn, then select the thing you want to modify. Holding shift to click both, so both are selected. Go to window, pathfinder, and then go minus front. And that cuts away the layer that was on top, the front layer. Alternatively, and this is nearly easier, go to shift M and then hold alt until you see that minus symbol on your cursor and then click and drag through the bits you wanna get rid of, like that. All right, so that's cut away. And now I'm gonna hit N on my keyboard, get rid of my guides layer, hit I to select that topography. And then I'm gonna come in here and redraw this part here so it doesn't so neatly hug this area. Okay, and at some point your hand's gonna get sore. So I usually draw in small chunks like that. Move my viewport, begin again small chunks like that. I find it a bit messy to have all these chunks lying around the place. So I'm going to select one of those chunks and I'm going to go to select same fill color. It selects everything at that elevation level. 
and then up in Pathfinder again, I'm going to now click Unite, and that will join them all into one nice, neat layer. Alternatively, you can go Shift M, and then simply click and drag through all the parts you want to unite. Boom. And repeat this process until you get to your desired elevation level as confirmed by the spreadsheet. Now, before I run the time lapse and end the video, I will do two more quick things on kind of like the aesthetic side of things or the making this look good. Again, good is very subjective. I'm sure lots of people hate my maps. Um, but the things I want to talk about are how to effectively draw mountain valleys and weaponizing folds and truss belts to make things look organic. So let's start with the mountain valleys. Let's say you're in the mountains and you'd like to make realistic looking mountains in this sort of topographic style. Let's choose, let's go up here. Let's choose a peak color. Let's say that for argument's sake. Oh, I on the keyboard, click it, N for the pen tool. This is gonna be rough and ready, but it'll hopefully demonstrate the principle. Let's imagine we have a line of mountain peaks, something like that. Okay, so if you will, for the draw in the standard kind of fantasy map mountains. Something that looks like that, right? Now, if you imagine the way water works, water will run off either side of this ridge line. So you'd have like, say a stream running down this way. But we got a peak here. So that means water will also run off into the stream like so. I'm sure you're aware of this. Your rivers will in fact look like rivers. Okay, so you'd have something like that. And then you have the same thing in the next valley over. And the important thing here is that it's going to be a ridge line along here as well, etc., etc., all the way up. So let me go I on the keyboard, select my next elevation down, N on the keyboard. And just to make things easy, I'm going to go down to here, or you can hit Shift D to switch drawing modes. And I'm going to go draw behind. So that just places my drawing underneath the already established artwork, as opposed to the um, default thing where it's placed on top of the artwork. Makes sense here because we're working from the top down. So I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to, first of all, I'm going to surround the peak uh, with uh, this tapering off elevation thing. Let's say something like this. There we go. So we'll have some sort of valley here. That means on either side we'll get peaks. So I'm just going to draw in a peak line here, something like that. All right, we got another line of peaks like here. Again, you can be a little bit neater than I'm being with a line of peaks along here, along here, something like that. Okay, so again, imagine the water is running off here and it'll also be running down from these peak lines as well. And that means then that this is a river valley, which means that on either side, there's more peaks. So you could have something like this, You've got a peak line down here, etc., etc. Again, you can be a little bit neater, but notice the pattern that's evolving here. And then as you proceed down through the topographic levels, you're going to eventually make your way out of the mountains and you'll find that like just naturally you're uh, going to want to start drawing things a bit smoother. So you have like jaggedy mountains and then smoother kind of uh, basins, etc., etc., all the way to the coast. So this sort of tree shape is common and extremely useful to make things look organic. And the other one is fold and trust belts. In fact, and I think the best way to describe this is just to show you. So we go back to the map here. And I should also note that this map is far from done. You'll see Picard, this continent here, he's have only just begun him, whereas things like this are complete. So this will be a work in progress. I'll continually update it and upload new images to the website for those who are interested in keeping track. And also changes need to be made. There's bits here, like this Rift Valley, I, I don't like in particular. I need to do something different with the Northern sections here. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Anyhow, fold and truss belts. If we have a look down here, you'll see that we have this shape here. Uh, so I started by drawing just this blobby plateau shape and then it felt a bit kind of like, well, blobby and plateau-like. So I came off it with just, with just little ridge lines like this, okay? And that helped kind of blend the plateau into the surrounding and I think makes a very 
organic looking shape. And all it is is just a bunch of uh, lines just coming off a blob. And also, if at all possible, make these like S-shaped curves. That looks pretty nice. Like you'll see here, these chaps here, they're following, particularly this chap, that's following like a nice S-shaped line. That looks very organic. Whereas if you have something that's just like, it's a lot less organic. Not saying it can't happen, but it doesn't sell the effect that this is like an organic thing. Whereas if you come in here with a nice S-shaped curve, it can really kind of sell things. Uh, I would be careful in general with these though, because these occur in certain places. So they commonly form in the forelands adjacent to major origins as deformation propagates outwards. Uh, if we look on Google Maps, we can see these things happening here in the Andes. If you have a look at here, you can see these like sinewy ridges occurring. The Appalachians is another good example of this. In fact, I would nearly argue a better example of this. You have these sinewy ridges occurring here. And they just make, well, at least in my opinion, they make things feel really nice and organic. And if not nice and organic, aesthetically pleasing, at least to me. Like, I really dig what I did here. I think this looks really cool. It may not be geologically massively accurate, but I don't care. I just think it looks really nice. Okay, that I think is that. I am going to start playing the time lapse now. And while it's playing, I'm just going to go through a quick summation. So first things first, in G plates, export out a map with all the information on it that you need to create topography, both for your land and your oceans. Set up a color ramp, or I should have mentioned this earlier, just steal a color ramp from Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a great section of color ramps. You can be fancy and use a blend tool like we talked about, or you can literally just create swatches. Once you've got a ramp set up, determine your highest elevation using the Worldsmith and use that to figure out the rough elevation levels of your color ramp. More detail at the lower elevations, less detail at the upper elevations. Look at other maps, topographic maps and atlases to study how they do things and get a vibe check in terms of creating good color ramps. Then use the Worldsmith to calculate heights and widths for your active and inactive mountain ranges. The active mountain ranges are those that are currently, well, tectonically active. Inactive mountain ranges are mountain ranges that were tectonically active, but no longer are, and as such are eroding down. Paying attention to the geological history of your planet, come up with heights and widths for each of the ranges you're working with. I model large Igings provinces as Andean plateaus. I could be wrong, someone let me know. Old mountain ranges that have ground down to zero, for more interesting topography, invoke uplift and have them rise up a little bit. When it comes to drawing, you can use offset path and roughen effect to speed things up a little bit. Mountainous valleys have a particular shape. Check out topographic maps and try to emulate that. Fold and truss belts occur next to major orogenic events, plus some others. In fact, go check out World Building Pastas post on it because again, best world building blog on the internet. Weaponize fold and truss belts to make more organic looking shapes. And I guess most of all is just like practice and look at maps. That's the main thing. Just keep looking at maps. Okay, that is land topography done then. I'm going to work on the southern continent, Picard, and get that guy finalized. And then we're going to talk ocean topography. All right, that's it. I had a blast. I hope you enjoyed, folks. Thanks a million for watching, subscribing, patronizing, all that good stuff. Y'all are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful nerds. Until next time, Edgar Ellis.